I call the member for Stirling. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the Minister has just had 15 minutes to come into the Parliament and outline some of the arrangements that he believes need to be put in place uh, for the people who were sent to Malaysia. Uh, all of the questions that the opposition uh, and many others in the community have been asked uh, legitimate questions about what's going to happen to the fate of people who are transferred from Australia to Malaysia if this deal is actually ever concluded by this government. Uh, he wasn't able to touch on or answer how people who are sent to Malaysia will sustain themselves. Uh, he wasn't able to answer whether the children who are sent there will go to school. Uh, he wasn't able to answer any of the basic questions about the protection of their human rights. Indeed, uh, what he did come in is he came in and he gave his usual rant. Uh, he professed that he wasn't obsessed uh, with the opposition spokesman for immigration, uh, the member for Cook, and then proceeded for 15 minutes to talk exclusively about the member for Cook. Um, there's probably a therapist he could call for that, um, but uh, perhaps he'd be best off concentrating on his own portfolio uh, and explaining to the Australian people about what's going to happen if this Malaysia deal actually ever does come to pass. Now, amongst Labor's extensive failures in government, in their four years in government, border protection uh, is surely one of the most disastrous. On coming to office, they found themselves with a situation where the people smuggling trade had been destroyed. There was four people within our detention network who had come here illegally by boat. That, the administration of that detention network was costing the Australian public millions and not billions. But within the space of four years, they've managed to push the people smugglers back into business. They've cost taxpayers literally billions of extra dollars. They've trashed any semblance of a coherent regional foreign policy. And they're currently presiding over the essential collapse of our immigration detention network. Things have been so bad in border protection that Julia Gillard was forced to knife Kevin Rudd and, he, and she Prime cited Labor's border to. protection catastrophe. Order. Remember, for Sterling the will affirm the Prime Minister by her title. Uh, I will do in future, Mr Deputy Speaker. But like the two areas that she nominated as one of the reasons that the government had lost its way, the carbon tax and the mining tax, she has managed to take a bad situation and make it worse. One of the first things she did when she came to office was she axed the Border Protection Subcommittee of Cabinet. This Prime Minister was so concerned about border protection, she was so concerned the government had lost its way on border protection, that she abolished the highest level decision-making body that they had for dealing with the problem. That body was, wasn't even a year old, and it had been announced by the former Prime Minister as a central part of Labor's response to people smuggling, and they shelled out $2.8 million of taxpayers' money on it. When, uh, when she was asked about that in the Parliament today, she said, oh, well, look, I'd prefer to just send these things to the National Security Committee of Cabinet. And I think her record on attending that National Security Committee of Cabinet speaks for itself. Uh, and clearly that shows where she, um, where she, how she prioritises border protection. Secondly, she came up with the East Timor solution, or the so-called East Timor solution. And I think this is probably right up there with the People's Assembly on Climate Change, uh, one of the silliest ideas that's ever been floated by an Australian Prime Minister. It was announced in the heat of an election campaign without consulting anyone within the government of East Timor, and they rightly killed the uh, policy from day one, uh, whilst Australian foreign policy professionals uh, were, had to trawl around the region exposing themselves to extreme ridicule uh, and the government pretended that there were still ongoing negotiations with the East Timorese when everybody with even a vague familiarity with this problem knew that that just wasn't true. Then came uh, the PNG solution. Um, they were going to reopen Manus Island, uh, something that the Papua New Guinea government was apparently well disposed towards. Apart from they still managed to bungle that um, by sending up such a low-level member of the government, because of course we know the Foreign Minister wouldn't deign to touch these issues, uh, they sent up the Parliamentary Secretary for Pacific Island Affairs. The fact that he was such a low-level emirate from the Australian government so offended the Papua New Guineans that they refused to make any progress on the arrangement, even though both sides of politics there were apparently well disposed towards it. Then they came up with the Malaysian People Swap deal. And in a deal that highlights what savvy negotiators, negotiators the Labor Party are, uh, they've managed to get the Malaysians to take 800 of ours for 4,000 of theirs, and we'll get to pay the total cost. According to the Prime Minister and her hapless minister, this was a done deal with only minor details to be sorted out. Uh, and it was announced on Saturday eight weeks ago. 
eight weeks ago, uh, and during that time the Immigration Minister has been out there briefing journalists that it's about to be signed. Uh, they briefed journalists that the Malaysian Home Affairs Minister was on his way down within the next few days. Uh, that's a few weeks ago. <laughs> Why Labor announced an arrangement before they concluded it is a great mystery. And it was, it was an incredibly silly thing to do because it completely undermined the very little leverage they had with the Malaysian government uh, and they made a desperate negotiating position uh, even worse. So they had a position that was so weak they could only arrange a five for one people swap. Um, then the government went further and they undermined any possible leverage that they could use in a panicked public announcement um, with this half-baked arrangements. Uh, then they've spent the next eight weeks, and the Minister's done it again today, congratulating themselves on breaking the people smugglers business model. Uh, now I've got news for the Minister and I've got news for Labor that they are the people smugglers business model. Uh, if they want to destroy the people smugglers business model, uh, the best thing they could do is resign. Uh, people smuggling had been destroyed when they came to office. And what they did is they took a defibrillator and they reinvigorated it. They zapped it back into life. Uh, and I think that it's probably the people smuggling community that are probably about the only ones left supporting uh, this Prime Minister. Uh, but the people smugglers have this government's measure. They understand that the Labor Party are all spin and no substance uh, on, uh, on uh, tackling their evil trade. Uh, and that's why since this announcement was made eight weeks ago, they've actually sent more people down illegally to Australia uh, that arrived in the last six years of the Howard government. Uh, the people smugglers have seen how these guys opposite operate, uh, and they don't take them seriously, um, but at least that's something they share with most of the Australian people. Now, the worse things have got, the more Labor has resorted to spin and misinformation, and they've tried to hide the true state of affairs from the Australian people. Uh, for 15 minutes, the Minister was completely and utterly unable to provide this House with even basic details of the ongoing negotiations with the Malaysians. I mean, what exactly has been going on for the past two months? Why has this minister been out there briefing journalists that an agreement is in, in, imminent? Um, what uh, is actually going to happen and how is this deal going to operate? Labor can't even tell the Australian people what's going to happen to the people who are currently detained on Christmas Island uh, who have arrived since this deal was announced, uh, who the government insists are going to be transferred for a third country um, but they can't say if Malaysia is going to accept these people, and they can't say if Malaysia is going to have the right of refusal over people who arrive here. They can't say if Malaysia will accept people who arrive in Australia without documentation, uh, which is a pretty important point considering about 80 per cent of people who arrive here illegally don't have any documentation. The, the Minister's uh, been briefing the media uh, that the people who sent to Malaysia are going to somehow be tagged. Uh, and that will seriously mean, and he seriously believes, and he's seriously telling people that he believes that's going to protect their human rights. They have absolutely no idea what's, what fate is going to befall the people that they send to Malaysia. As I said, they don't know how they'll be fed, they don't know how they sustain themselves. Uh, people there don't have work rights. Imagine if you were sent there and you had a family. Uh, what would you do uh, if you couldn't work? What would you be required to do to support them? Um, you know your children won't be educated, and they certainly can't guarantee that people won't be subject to corporal punishment. These are legitimate questions that the Australian people are right to ask, and the government should be providing the answers to them. We don't even know basic details about how people will be transferred to Malaysia. Um, in the wake of the Oceanic Viking debacle, um, where asylum seekers were able to essentially hijack an Australian government vessel, um, what will happen if we have a repeat of that on a charter flight or an Australian Air Force flight flying people from Christmas Island up to Kuala Lumpur. Um, they haven't provided the Australian people with any details about what security will be provided on flights. Uh, will it be provided by the Australian Federal Police? Uh, if so, what powers will they have, particularly once that plane lands in Malaysia? Uh, will the Malaysian authorities be responsible for taking people off if they refuse to get off that flight? I asked the Home Affairs Minister uh, last week in the House uh, exactly that series of questions, and his response was so vague uh, as to be precisely worthless. Uh, and quite frankly, he should have just got up and shrugged his shoulders and stopped uh, wasting everybody's time. Look, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was perhaps once possible to give these guys the benefit of the doubt about some of these policy questions, but when you've got such an astonishing record of failure and incompetence, 
uh, the time to provide that benefit of the doubt has well and truly passed. This eight weeks of silence since this deal was announced Order. means that this Malaysian deal has gone completely off the rails. The and, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is certainly a better way, and I would ask the government to embrace it. I...